from just a pure number standpoint are there enough men for women there are more women than there are men period full stop if you start talking about educational homogamy and this is when you want to marry somebody on the same level as you the same class level same education same um, socioeconomic status level the women black women outnumber black men there as well why I wrote this book is I'm trying to destigmatize singlehood you have so many people that find themselves in relationships that are abusive toxic unfulfilling and even oppressive because they don't want to hold the title of single. Why do we continue to police black women? Just let us be. First of all, let me say this. This is chapter 10 in the book. Um, <laughs> if you're over the age of five in America and you're black, you need to get yourself a therapist. I think if we're not careful, we will equate being promiscuous with being single. Why do you want to be married? It's a very simple question, mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of implications to it. It's important to have a conversation about how structure plays into this. Because if we don't have a structural conversation, there's gonna be a lot of black women that are professional and got their stuff together, like, what was me, what's wrong with me? Baby girl, listen, nothing's absolutely wrong with you. There's structural forces that were designed well before you got here. Mm -hmm. So don't put the onus solely on yourself. Mm. We always ask single folks why you're single, but we don't ask married folks why you married. Stop asking us that. Hey guys, welcome back to Real, Real Life, Life Scenario. Scenario. The best Sh song in the world. It is. Oh, it we're is. singing for I like real. that. We are singing. We are singing. That's, that's how we kick off the show. That's how we kick off the show. Shout out to all the real lovers out there. Welcome. If you're new, welcome to Real Love Scenario. I'm Dre. This is Rhonda. It's me. Um, make sure you join our Real Love Scenario gang or Real Lover gang. That's right. Say, that's real, right. Real, real Same, difference. Same difference. You know, Same you know thing. what's up if you've been uh, here. If this is not your first time, you, you know what's up. Yeah. If you want to join the gang, make sure you subscribe, like, comment, follow, do everything with the podcast, mm -hmm. and you'll be part of the gang. That's just the initiation. Nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. Less than five minutes. Yeah. I've gone through the exercise myself and I actually like mm. every single video myself. You should. I do. It and it's sense. it's our stuff and I still like it. Yep. Gang gang. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we're back, as promised, with a guest. A very special day for us. And we're excited to have this conversation. Ron, do you want to introduce who we got here? I would love to. I met this beautiful woman uh, last year in D.C. at the Gathering Spot. Shout out to our family at the Gathering Spot. Um, there are so many words because she's got that many titles. So mm. I'm going to do my best. Okay. You ready? Do I need a list? Like, yeah, do, count? yeah okay. you know the vibes. Okay. Demographer. Mm. Author. Mm. Sociologist. Okay. Professor. Wow. Scholar. Mm golfer mm. and practically an Olympic medalist swimmer because mm. I've seen the videos myself. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on, look, hold on. Oh, oh, oh. and we just found out she a singer. Ooh. I am so not a singer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chris Marsh, welcome. Thank welcome you. To it the is couch. such a pleasure to be here with you all on my spring break. Yes. Yes. Spring break. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. We're so happy to have you. Yes. I am holding your beautiful book. It's gorgeous. I Thank adore you. this book. I love the way it looks on my bookshelf. I was just telling you this. The Love Jones cohort. If you don't know, now you know. <laughs> we're putting you on. And we're going to talk a lot <laughs> about this book today. It is such a deep dive into being single and yes. living alone for the black middle class. Yes. Which is like just... Just that alone makes me like, she's so smart. <laughs> oh, Jesus. We just about to Lies. get into the facts. It is a very meaty read. And and like a true scholar, it, it, it very much gives you all the reference points. And I love, love, love and adore that. So thank you for sitting on the couch with Dre and I. We I appreciate it. I know you're a uh, professor, too. I wish I could take your class. <laughs> Oh, and I teach a whole class on the boondocks. I heard about weeks that. weeks on the boondocks. I heard about Please that. Please ask about that during the podcast. I do. I like, <laughs> I always wanted to talk to somebody who could deep dive into that because it's just such, and we ain't going to go too long on this part. We'll, we'll, we'll That's okay. The boondocks it. is kind of worth it. But I, I love it because it's just like you have these satirical, like just, you know, when it comes to figures in the black community right. and mm -hmm. it breaks it down so well. And I was just watching American fiction too. I don't know if you saw that. I before. haven't seen it yet. It it kind of has that same feel to it. Mm. Um, and I love just 
somebody who's way smarter than me that can help me break down these different things because I find it so interesting. Right. And I'm thinking like we're in a day and age where you have to meet the students where they are. Yeah. There's no reason why I should have like a textbook to try to talk about like race issues. I'm like, let's use the boondocks and let's try to pick out the social commentary that runs through every single episode. And it's been just a, it's been such a great class. And it's even on it's even eight o'clock in the morning on Tuesday and Thursday. And they show up at eight o'clock in the morning mm. on Tuesday and Thursday to talk about the boondocks. Good great subject. Them. Man. Yeah, right. Great subject, man. Right. And, and sleep when I, at eight thirty. And when I, <laughs> right, right, right. No, but they come because my students are like, "Oh, Doctor Marsh, I'm so scared to be be up at eight. But they're like, they get up for the class. Oh, that's dope. And the one thing that they say, and the biggest compliment they give me is, they say we're looking at the boondocks so differently now because all I'm trying to I teach people that. is critical thinking skills. For sure. Mm -hmm. I just what there's there's you see stuff at face value, but what's behind some of this? Yeah. yeah. So when they're consuming stuff on the big screen, the little screen, and on social media, now I've given them the tools to be critical thinkers so that I love my class yeah, I well, absolutely love my you class you have your Uncle Ruckus class just let me know when I can sit in the back and uh <laughs> it's so funny because my TAs and I, they're my TAs know like I don't want to talk about Uncle Ruckus, but we have to, right? Because every racial and ethnic group has an Uncle Ruckus, For and sure. so we really need to just talk about how they, but people buy into all of these stereotypes about their own racial and ethnic group and start to hate their own racial and ethnic group. So, yeah, we have to talk about him. We have to, but yeah. first, first and foremost, we are going to talk about. The book and I have to read this because to me this this write up in the back by Bella De Paolo, uh -huh. the author of Singled Out, I just love the way she sums it up and she says with the Love Jones cohort, Chris Marsh has transformed the way we understand single people and single life, combining brilliant sociological analysis with the intimate voices of people who are single and living alone in the black middle class. Doctor Marsh sets aside tired old de deficit narratives of single life, especially black single life, and shows how single people flourish. This book is a triumph. Uh, I mean, I, perfect. <laughs> you know, this is so funny because I've never heard the back of the the endorsements. I've never heard no? them like read aloud. No. That it's sounds, perfect. I was like, whoever that Chris Marsh is sounds fabulous. <laughs> 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 so listen, as a forever student and a person who loved school, I really loved school, even though like college was right where I was like, that was the okay, peak. Yeah, I'm good <laughs> <That's here. right. laughs> to me, I had to bring back the good old who, what, when, where, why. Uh -huh. Right. So to me, I want you to like answer the question about the book in the who, what, when, where and why. Why did you do it? Who is it about? Who is it for? When did you think of it? And really, why? Why the book? Wow. OK, so let me let me see if I can do all of that. What I do want to say first, is I want to talk a little bit about the cover of the book, because you okay, started out yes, saying that you really liked the cover. Yeah. And um, if we can hold it up so you can see the cover. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> here's what's kind of interesting about the book. Um, in, the, in the preface of the book, I say that this is a politics of citation. And what I mean by that is that. I'm citing black scholars that talk about black families. There's so many scholars that do not look like me who have made their entire career talking about black families. Mm. And I was not and could not write a book like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a politics of citation. I'm citing black scholars, especially black female scholars. So I finished writing the book. It took me seven years to write it. I'm trying to find a cover. So I wanted like single people like doing really cute stuff, like at the grocery store, sitting at a coffee shop, doing yoga and all single people. I found this beautiful illustration and they're like this beautiful black women, big, thick afros, thick lips, red lipstick, big earrings, everything. And I was like, let me do my due diligence and look at the artists of these illustrations. Mm -hmm. None of them, not any of them were black, really? not a one. In fact, a lot wow. of them were like in Russia. Mm. And I was like, I can't because my publisher gave me a list of people that I could choose from. And so I was like, in good conscience, I cannot put if I'm trying to be about it, I got to be about it. If I'm yeah, saying yeah. this in politics citation, I can't have a white artist on the cover. And so I found uh, the African American Museum. They have open source pictures. And that's actually a quilt. There's a black woman who lived in D.C. and she would bring young black people to her house and that's teach them how to quilt. So it's a quilt. Awesome. And the reason why I thought the quilt really made quilt really made sense is because I also talk about how friends play a central role in the lives of singles. So I was like, yeah, it just kind of all makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Like, well, OK, but so why did I write this book? The reason the main reason why I wrote this book is I'm trying to destigmatize singlehood. Mm -hmm. You have so many people that find themselves in relationships that are abusive, toxic, unfulfilling, and even oppressive because they don't want to hold the title of single. Mm -hmm. 
And so I'm trying to destigmatize singlehood and have people stand confidently in their singleness. And then I am, I, I even say in the beginning of the book, I'm pro marriage. I think black marriage is a beautiful thing only if it's done right. I'm not just going to endorse marriage for the sake of right. endorsing marriage, but it's really important that you stand confidently in who you are individually mm -hmm. before you try to get into any relationships. It always baffles me when people think marriage is like a panacea. If I can just get married, all my social ills are going to go away. <laughs> but that other person got social ills too. So you got right. two yeah. people that got social ills. Like, yeah, so just a boat is just a sinking. <laughs> <laughs> and so I really am trying to destigmatize um, singlehood. And I even say at the end of the book, after reading this book, I hope you're just as likely to ask somebody, why are you married? As you are to ask somebody, why are you single? Mm. We always ask single folks why you're single, but we don't ask married folks why are you married. If single folks have Stop to... Uh-huh. <laughs> like, well, first of all, stop asking everybody, right? right? But if you're going to ask, be consistent. Ask everybody. Because yeah. when you start to ask single people, it gets back to that deficit model. Something must be wrong with you because you yeah. don't have an MRS mm -hmm. degree. Something must be wrong with you. And yeah. so I'm like, no, I push back on that whole entire narrative. Um, so I I, why I wrote the book, I started the book actually when I was in graduate school. I was a mm. demographer. So I'm a trained demographer. So I build big, large data sets. And I did a lot of quantitative work mm -hmm. but then i even say in the book i wanted to put metaphorical meat on the numeric bones that i built over my career mm -hmm. so the first part of my career i published a whole bunch of academic journals that were all quantitative and if you don't know how to read coefficients or standard deviations it means nothing to you like literally my head is spinning like right as we speak right synthetic cohort analysis all those kind of great like what like right right so i'm like okay but here's the thing i was really trying to establish that this group exists yeah so i wanted to use national data to demonstrate that there was this demographic shift away from married couples to young black professionals who weren't married and don't have any children the characters you would see in the movie love jones mm -hmm. so i did the quantitative work then i said you know i really want to talk to people understand more about their lives i want to understand what they are doing as a demographer here's yeah. what i know some people are just not getting married i am not putting value judgment on it i just want to know what you are doing because right. we spend so much time saying why aren't you married why mm -hmm. aren't you partner why you don't have any why don't you have any children but we don't say what are you doing how are you deciding where you're going to live how are you deciding when you're going to buy a home Yep. Who are you, are you establishing some kind of like, yeah. Yeah. right? Are you establishing establishing some kind of living trust and wills for like your assets? Those are the kind of conversations that I try to I try to take uh, undertake in the book. Now, if you do pick up the book, there's a couple things I have to tell you real quickly about the book. Um, what, how to read it. Um, you have to, <laughs> I am a sociologist and a scholar as, as, as was said in my introduction. So the introduction and chapter one are theoretically dense. If okay. that is not your get down, get the general arguments I'm making and just fast forward to chapter two, because chapter two through 10 is a very different read. Yeah. And um, my book is published, my book is published with Cambridge University Press, mm -hmm. which is one of the top academic presses in the world. Yes. And I tried to write the book and just started chapter two and the, my publisher was like no 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 it's like we're we're cambridge i was like oh <laughs> so like we need a theoretical section and i say this everywhere that i go when i wrote the book i really wrote the book for pookie and them mm -hmm. okay. and what i mean by that is that if i would have written the book to my colleagues i would have disenfranchised an entire group of people mm -hmm. yeah. but if pookie and them can be on the corner talking about demographic terms then my colleagues will have to respect it yeah. so two to ten is for pookie and them <laughs> chapters one and two the introduction of chapter one is so that I can be published in Cambridge University <laughs> Press. So if theory ain't your get down, just, just go ahead and fast forward two. right on to chapter two. I also put footnotes at the very end of the um, pages because there's really great golden nuggets in the footnotes. Um, how long is it, how long is it taking me to write the book? It has taken me seven years oh, wow. to write the book, partly because somewhere when I started, after I collected the data and while I was writing the book, I also stopped and did some implicit bias training for police officers. Please. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about that because I want to keep my blood pressure down. So let's not talk <laughs> about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, and so I finally, but I I stopped working with the police department and I finished the book up in, gosh, now I think it was 2022, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. it came out in 23. Um, and I wrote it for everybody. So here's the one thing that's really kind of interesting. I tell my students this, students this all the time. Like, um, when we talk about like racism, white people may not know what it's like to like experience racism. Right. Yeah. I was like, we talk about like sexism. A man may not know what it's like to be a woman. But if we all live long enough, we'll all know what it's like to be discriminated against because of age. Because ageism is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't see race, class, creed, or color. Uh, similarly, we've all held the title of single. 
at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Even as some people may call the smug marries at some point or even single at some point. So the book really is for everybody because you're leaving singlehood, because you're returning back to singlehood, because you know other people that are in singlehood. Everybody can read the book and you don't have to be middle class. I decided to insert myself at the conversation of middle class black folks, but the book does resonate and should resonate with everybody because everybody knows what it's like to be single at some point in time. For sure. For the context of the conversation, can you define like what singleness is? Like, is that dating and not married? Is that like, what is that uh, in context in reference to the book? So when I say single, I say single, never married. Okay. So you could be in a dating relationship, but you are not married. You're not officially partnered and you're living, you're not living with your romantic partner. Okay. Cause in, in I think one of the respondents in the book, I think might've been engaged. And I was like, engagement doesn't always translate into marriage. In fact, I was engaged. Please ask why we not together. I was like, let me tell you that story. Oh, we're going to get into that. We will. But, but um, uh, so it, it's okay. It's like, you're just not, not living with the person. And the reason why that was really important, see, people push back a lot and say, well, what about people that are returning to single? And I'm like, no, I wanted people who have never been exposed never to the stimuli. Mm-hmm. And the stimuli is actually marriage because I wanted to ask some questions about like estate planning, right? And so if you think about people that were married, <clears throat> excuse me, if you think about people that were married and then they have like, we had one uh, interview that we did with a young woman and about 45 minutes or an hour into the interview, she's like, well, I was married, but like my husband is considered dead to me so he don't count i was like <laughs> well that's not what we that's mean not how it works. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how this works <laughs> uh, there was somebody Even else if he really that, was dead like, that's, that's still not, not how it works <laughs> not at all there was somebody else that said you know my children are money grubbing leeches so when they turn 18 mm. they're not getting anything but Ooh. you have children so you get to make that decision yeah. i want people who aren't married don't have children and yeah. have assets because they're middle class. They typically are going to have some kind of asset. Yeah. I want to know who you're going to leave your assets to, who you're going to bequeath your assets to. If we look at the social science literature, yeah. class status is usually transferred from parent to child. And so our assets. So if you have the house or something, it's going to go to your child. But when you don't have that direct descendant, who does it actually go to? Yeah. So that's why I didn't want people that were married. That's why I didn't want people that had children. So I, they can be in a dating relate. They can be dating. They just can't be living with their romantic partner. Gotcha. Wow, that's that is. That is very, very, very particular because I feel like so many people. Well, then again, I can't say that, but so many people are in that limbo, like especially like I'm 40. Right. So I think about several of my friends are either married. The other group is divorced or just broken up with, but they used to live together. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rest of us who have (laughs) never done it. I have never done any of it. Married, no children, none of Mm -hmm. that. So I would have been really great stimuli for the book. Um, I do want to get into though, outside of the book, because you just talked about a previous relationship, but Mm -hmm. I want to like go back to Chris, just Chris, Uh not Dr. Marsh, not Mm -hmm. the author, just the, just the girl, Chris. Uh What was she like? I know you're from California. So like, what was, what was love like? growing up for you? So um, I've always had a lot of energy. So I'm like one of those kids that would just like play, 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 play and just like pass out. Like okay. <laughs> my parents might just put a little blanket on her. She'll be fine. <laughs> or the, that child that like never ever wanted to go to bed or got up super early because I always was afraid I was going to miss something. Yeah. I'm still that person like <laughs> as, um, as an adult. So um, my closest relationship is probably with my sister on the planet is with my sister. She's 14 months older than me. Nice. And um, we love hating each other. So we talk like every day, all day. We'll FaceTime all day long, but then we'll argue like all day long. But, <laughs> oh, you were that to work? I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, you shouldn't head out for breakfast. So, <laughs> so I have a very loving relationship with my sister, but we're very, very, very different. My parents dressed us alike because we were so close in age until I think we were like in high school. And I think my my parents, oh, my I mother, like those yeah, honey. Do y'all look mother, alike? I, we do. We do. Okay. I, I'll show you a picture of her. Yeah, we do look. So it's Kim, Kelly, and Chris. So it's oh, all wow. three Ks. And my parents are William and Deborah. So I don't even know where, <laughs> where that, the case came from. the letter right. and stuck with it. <laughs> and then my father uh, got a luxury car and he put my three Ks on the back of it. Oh. And we live in a predominantly white area. So oh. yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. And he got a little pendant that says KKK. And I know like people are like, okay, Ooh. there's a disconnect. Like, it's probably messy. Like, with right, their heads. Yes, like, yes, yes. It makes me think about um, the Dave Chappelle skit when oh, he was, yeah. oh God, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, oh, Jesus. Oh, he did, he's yes, blind. yes, 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 yes. Okay. 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 yes. Sorry, yes. sorry. Yes. Um, so very close relationship with my family and my sisters. Um, I think now as an adult, I really, and I'm, I was talking to somebody just the other day and I feel like 
I absolutely admire and adore my students. I am only still in academia because of my students. Because I think once George Floyd happened mm -hmm. and once the world stopped on its axis because of COVID, we all had to do some soul searching. For and sure. so one of the things that I was really clear about, and this gets back to my police training for a moment, I say it everywhere I go, police officers kill black bodies, professors kill black spirits. Mm. but we never make the five o'clock news. And so either these, these institutions are not, the academic institutions are not really made for black students. They tell you how to think, how to talk, how to write, and your, your experiences just don't, aren't valued that much. So I was like, I'm gonna just quit. I'm gonna open up a yoga studio or a florist shop. I didn't even care. That's I was so gonna, interesting. I, was you... gonna, I, actually, I really wanted to be a barista. I wanted to be a barista with a PhD because <laughs> Issa Rae in California has a coffee shop. <laughs> she does, I really it want, is very I, fancy. Right, it's fancy. I wanted to be a barista. <laughs> then I was like, no. The only reason why I'm going to stay in academia is because I admire and adore my students and I want to be able to advocate for them. So I want to be in there just like busting stuff down and just, you know, fussing and cussing because I can, <laughs> because they can't necessarily. So I am only still in academia for my students the day. They get on my nerves. I am throwing my keys under you my out. door. And I'm I'll out. be a barista. And, I, and I'll be a barista. I'll be like, how can I help you? And that's a double chocolate latte. <laughs> okay. Let me tell you about some 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 uh, demographics really quick while, while I do this for you. You got both sides of it. Right. You got both sides. Is that only PWIs, though, you feel like that is? Or oh, so, all so you don't call it. See, I, I, see. Oh, I didn't say this part. So in the book, you also, oh, I did say you got to read the footnotes. Because one of the mm -hmm. things I say in the footnotes, and I give attribution where attribution is give is deserve, deserving. One of my students taught me this. Um, I don't say PWI. I say historically white institutions. and or Yeah, because you say historically black. These have been historically white institutions that have that are based on terror and exclusion. So I'm calling them historically white. I'm not calling them predominantly white. But to the point that you're making, I think it can be across the board because sometimes, mm -hmm. and what it, what's the saying? Not all skin folk are kin folk. That's true. Sometimes, That's true. Well, we done started out with Uncle Ruckus, so you know there's, there's some, <laughs> uncle, <laughs> you know there's some <laughs> uncle Ruckuses in these historical black colleges and universities uh, sure. as they are in these historically white institutions as well. <laughs> so yeah, and sometimes it's black scholars that tell black, other black students how you need to talk, how you need to write. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and so I, I wish I had this quote. I read a Bell Hooks, I think that's her name, Bell Hooks, <laughs> right? Uh, it's called We Are Cool. It was a book, and it talked about. Oh, I wish I had that quote. I'm gonna find it, and I'm gonna post it in here somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. But it speaks. It spoke exactly to what you're talking about. How sometimes when some Black folks do reach a certain level of, I guess. I don't know, status, if elitist, status. Yeah. you know, it's almost like kind of not wanting to share that with anybody or reserving their selves to then try to continue to get more access and more power. Right. And as long as they stay with the flow of things and don't disrupt things, then the powers that be will give them the opportunity to have access to more. So they're scared to disrupt anything when they get to that level out of fear of their position, you know, or them mm -hmm. losing their possible position. Right. And I think I come from the very opposite perspective. I'm disrupting stuff. So yeah. I know that I'll never get to that level and I'm okay with that because I'm, do, I'm doing enough disruption on the local level. I don't need to be like at a national level in the university setting. But yeah, I think in some ways you have to sell your soul. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's a conversation we had the last episode and it kind of goes into your book too when it talks about singleness. I told Rhonda that I feel like one of the hardest questions in life is what is versus what should be. Mm. And a lot of times when you go with what should be, that is very lonely, right? Because you know things should operate this way, but you're disrupting things. You're going against the flow and a lot of people get upset yeah. if you do that. So you're left out on your own. But if you go with what is, although it may not be right, you're going with the flow. So things can tend to be a lot easier for you. So I know when we're talking about different stuff with academics, you know, that can be a thing. But I also think in relationships, mm -hmm. that's a thing as well. And what leads to singleness that a lot of people look at life and look at society and say, this is not how it should be. It should be like this. But sometimes that leaves them single right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. because they're pushing it back against that so how do you combat that in your mind like how do you make that decision on a daily basis on choosing what is versus what should be what is and what should be that's a really great conversation it i is. think what's what's kind of important about that whole the whole conversation is is that so often we police black women and tell them what they should and should not do and I am of the mindset that just stop policing black women. Let them do whatever they want to do. The book is about, is about both black men and women. But 
whatever they want to do, they should be able to do. If they want to date the bus driver, if they want to date the person that owns a fleet of buses, buses, buses. Why do we continue to continue to care? Why do we continue to police black women? Just let us be. And if, I, if we want to be single, let us stand confidently in our singleness. If we want to be in a relationship, let us stand confidently in our relationship. But just let us be. You tell us how loud we should talk, how loud we shouldn't talk. You tell us how big our butts should be, how big our butts, butts shouldn't be. You tell us how we should wear our hair, how our mm-hmm. hair shouldn't be. It's, oh, hallelujah. God. Right. All that. All that. And don't, yeah, don't, don't have a, a modicum of success and then they're going to tell you everything you should do. But like, I got here, okay. I don't think I need any more input from you all. So I think the part that, part of the conversation I'm really trying to have in the book is like, let black women just be. Give us our space where we can just be. How do you, like, when did you, not how, because you talked about growing up with your parents mm-hmm. and, and so clearly you're in a, in a marital home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was they divorced what? after twenty five years? Okay, <laughs> okay. But then you you got to a point. I assume that you arrived to this station of like you know what? Like I really like it here, and I'm not. I'm open to love because I've heard yeah. you say that I'm open to love. I believe in marriage. I believe in all of that. But like, there's pure and genuine joy in not having it. Like right. I enjoy my singleness which for so many people i mean even myself like i think i told you this when we sat down and talked it's a concept of sorts that like i'm even challenging myself with like yes there are plenty of days where i'm like home alone i have no one to be responsible for other than two small dogs and i'm just like i love it here like nothing to do (laughs) no one to think about no one to consider i don't have to be like what do you want to eat or what do you want like it's great but then there are other days where i'm like (laughs) I would like to cook for somebody <laughs> like it's it, I go up and down, up and down, up and down with that. At what point did you arrive? If, 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 if that's the right word to this station of like, I'm really good. I'm really, really good here. I feel really amazing in my singleness. Right. So, so for the record, you know, there's, there's some brothers that's trying. I mean, they <laughs> trying. Okay? Like, I mean, hello, you see the material. Like, right, listen, listen. She ain't saying she ain't got no suitors now. Like, right, she, she got them. Like, right. And it's so funny because people are like, do you give dating advice? I was like, let me tell you that best dating advice. Two things. One, write a book about singlehood. They will slide in your DM. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you something. I'm like, they like, uh, number let one. me show you something. I was right, like, right. And, and number two, go to the airport. I promise you, air, there must be like beer goggles at the airport. I get picked up. Uh, I get hit on so many times. I go to the airport. I'm like every time it I go to the look airport. Really cute at the I, airport. I'm telling you, the the lining does really well. The <laughs> airport now does something for me. I was like, go to the airport. Just go. Uh, don't go to. They got to go to the airport. Like, <laughs> just dress up and go to the airport. <laughs> right. Okay. But to the point I was making earlier about now, I have to be honest. I think this is where I I don't have a counterfactual data because I am a professor, but. I feel like I have relationships with my students. Like I was saying before, I really admire and adore my students. And Mm -hmm. I think that that makes me stand more comfortably in my singleness because I can pour into them and I appreciate pouring into them for 16 weeks and then go on and do wonderful things. Mm -hmm. I don't want you for 16 weeks. I want you to move on. Um, But I do think like once I got to Maryland, I became a professor and I really started to advocate and... um, support my students, it just made it so much easier for me to just kind of stand comfortably in my singleness. And so I decided like in my personal life, I don't want to be responsible for anybody's well-being. First of all, let me say this. This is chapter 10 in the book. Um, <laughs> if you're over the age of five in America and you're black, you need to get yourself a therapist. Ooh. One of the things I'm trying to do is destigmatize mental health and, and well-being as well. So we all need therapists, but there's some uh, some people, and especially some of the men in the book, don't necessarily like see therapists. Women kind of are a little bit more inclined to see therapists based on um, the cohort in the book. But I'm like, I'm not taking care of your emotional well-being. I don't want to be, I don't want to have to worry about your well-being. Mm-hmm. I want to come home at the end of my day and not use my voice again till the next day. I don't want to hear my own voice. Mm-hmm. And so to give my very best to my students and then not come home and give my very best to my partner, I think is self-centered and it's short-sighted. So I'm like, I have given so much to my students. I have nothing left to give and I'm okay with giving nothing else but to myself when I get home. And I'm like, yes, I appreciate the same way I left my house house when I went to work the same way so, and like <laughs> eating I'm like yeah I'll have some gum for dinner and call it a day I'll call I'll have some trident be like I'm gonna, I'm gonna have trident for dinner <laughs> you're on your own 
Right. <laughs> so I am. I really, I really am embracing my singleness. But I'm also, I also reserve the right that if you, if I'm here a year from now, I'm like, oh, I'm married. I'm happily married. I'm like, yes, it works. I'm like, yeah. I'm not saying that it's the a, message isn't lost. Yeah. It, it is not mm-hmm. lost mm-hmm. because I think you still have to enjoy all of the journeys like I've talked about on the podcast and just in my personal life like I've yo-yo with my weight and I got to a point where I was like you have to actually love the body you are in yeah. in order to feel really good about taking care of it so that you can change it and improve it like yeah. I realized the more I spoke poorly to myself about the body that I wanted to change and improve, the harder it was for me to actually do that. I just right. was like, Ugh, I hate it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to do anything about it. I just, and so it was like the same, to me, it's like the same thing with singleness. It's like, you want to be joyful and happy and and f- as fulfilled about life because there's so much more to it than, than being in a relationship, ah. but also so that a single man or a suitor that is, yeah. he can see that, right. that you are right. not like moping around. Like I just really need to be in a relationship. Like right. no one's going to want the person right. that's crying about being you single. Don't, you, you don't even want to be around that person. Like, right, right. That like, 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 right. Like, so why like, would somebody oh, else want to be? But what I also think <laughs> is really important. We have to, and I talk about it in the book. We have to talk about what kind of relationship. Because people mm. often say like, oh, I want to be in a relationship. We have so many non-romantic nurturing relationships, oh, yeah. also known as friends, mm-hmm. where I think that that's doing a disservice to your friends when you say like, oh, I want to be in a relationship. So you're not in a relationship with all of your friends. Those relationships don't matter. But yeah. we put all of our eggs in the romantic marriage basket Mm -hmm. and and then if we do get married sometimes we forsake our friends but your friends will be there your partner won't always be there the data is kind of clear that you have people that are starting to age and partners are divorcing them because they just don't know how to deal with an aging spouse but Mm -hmm. your friends will be there like when you tell your friend you ain't feeling well they showing up with the ginger ale the salting cracker (laughs) (laughs) everything right like right so i think it really is important for us to say like okay when you say you want a romantic relationship, what are you not getting in your non-romantic nurturing relationships? Mm. Because if you need somebody to cook for, you can always call me and I can come to the house and slide <laughs> to the house and you can cook for me, right? True. You want to go on vacation with somebody, you know, it's like you have to think about like, and the reason why I think this is really important is because loosely related but i was talking to a friend of mine and so he just recently got married and so he used to always say i just like light-skinned women. I just like light-skinned women. Mm. Mm. And so one day he said it and I said, "No you don't." <laughs> and I gave a really long pregnant pause. And I said, I would respect you and appreciate you so much more if you would say, I've been conditioned from a very young age to think that closer to white is right. And mm. so I'm getting me the lightest skinned person I could find. He happened to marry a light skinned woman. But I digress. Okay. Mm-hmm. Same thing with being in a relationship or being married. Why do you want to be married? It's a very simple question, Mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of implications to it. We've been taught from a very, very young age that you're supposed to be married. You're supposed to be in this partnership. But why do you honestly want to be in this relationship? Because that's what you're taught. That's what you're longing for. It's a small question, but it has big implications. And I ask people, I would admonish people, answer, ask the question to yourself, why do you want to be married? Because if you look at like social media, there's one web, there's one person I follow like on social media and like, Everything's like so perfect in all their marriages. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to unfollow you because this is not always not reality. The, it is so not reality, but no. some people want that. They see that. And they're mm-hmm. like, I want this too. I was like, but you don't know the backstory. Yeah. I was like, I got to unfollow you because you're just toxic. You're just toxic. <laughs> I just can't. I just absolutely cannot. And that's why you're saying therapy is so important, right? To dis- make a distinction between what you truly believe and what you've been taught to believe, right? Mm-hmm. Because even when I think of women and their singleness, there's the aspect of companionship, love, the dreamy feelings. But then also some women feel like if I want to start a family, if I want to have a child, it has to be in this construct, right? I can't do it without a husband, right? So that then forces people to settle and get in relationships mm-hmm. too. So I can imagine, and then with women too, the biological like clock and stuff that people be thinking about, you guys have a lot of pressure <laughs> just <laughs> mentally <laughs> on like trying to figure out when, why. And I feel like you women feel the pressure of singleness a lot more than men because our one runway is a lot longer. And honestly, if we reach a certain level, um, we're desired at a certain mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Um, so we have, typically a lot more options, I Mm -hmm. feel like, too. Mm -hmm. But I also think, to your point, that women do have a lot of stresses with being single and the biological clock and all that's real. And we actually talk, I actually talk in the book about freezing your eggs, like being like a foster parent, all that kind of great stuff. But I also think what's really important about the conversation, too, is that women, 
uh, in the book in particular have learned how to navigate their singleness more so because they have these sister circles. They have their girlfriends. They have some people that they go to brunch with, some people they go to like go play golf with, some people they go to church with. So they built these non-romantic nurturing relationships and they have a network. The men in the book don't really have that same network. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason I think is because they feel like, you know, they even kind of say it, if they have these non-romantic nurture relationship and they tell their guy friend, like, I'm sad or I'm lonely, they're like, oh, man, you soft, man mm. up, all this kind of <laughs> stuff. So it becomes like it, it's um, stigmatized if mm. you have these non-romantic nurture relationships. So I do hope after reading the book, we can normalize non-romantic nurture relationships for men as much for black men as much as we do for black women because black women they're able to navigate singlehood so much better because they do have those girlfriends that are with them and the data is pretty clear about this this is, I appreciate what you said earlier I got receipts mm -hmm. I'm coming <laughs> with I know you said yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so yeah the data is kind of clear on that so there's some there's, there's data that suggests that people that are long term long term singles never married yeah. as they age they tend to be happier mm. and part of the reason why they tend to be happier is because they built themselves a network of friends to be around that's what the quantitative of data is suggesting yeah. but people that are returning back to singlehood because of widowed separation or divorce they put all like i said earlier they put all their eggs in the marriage basket mm. and so they didn't they did they forsake their friends so they don't have a network and they tend to not be as happy as those that are never married long-term singles because they have the network and those other relationships are supplementing not replacing essentially right uh, uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. No, it's the, but I think, yeah, it's not a replacement. But I also, if if we say it's a replacement, that suggests that the ultimate relationship is the partnered married one. That's why I was stumbling over my answer. Because I want to make sure that everybody understands that that's not, that doesn't have to be the gold standard. That doesn't have to be like the, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, the um, um, oasis that we're looking for. And I think that that's why I wanted, I was like, uh, no, they're just, they're just, they're, 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 they're relationships. Yeah. They're, but everybody thinks about just the romantic one yeah. and those ones that are non, non romantic nurture relationships, those actually can be stronger than some of the romantic ones. So if we say replacement, that suggests that it almost puts it on a hierarchy. So I don't want to say that it's a replacement. Gotcha. Yeah. I even think about, um, like, you know, not to harp too much on like a woman's experience in singleness, but one that's what I relate to today. But I even think about like our experience being proposed to like when most of the time when when women are proposed to, we have an extremely emotional reaction to it. Like we fall apart. We're crying. In fact, if our friends or family members are there and the women, yeah. they're all crying. It is it is almost like to me recently very fascinating to watch. And I think we have that feeling because we have been taught for so long that this is it. Pinnacle. Like when this it's happens, not. like baby, you are on the precipice of greatness. Like you have cracked the code. And it's like, I I want that, don't get me wrong. And it, when it happens, I will likely still be crying because <laughs> I've been, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we're, we're still gonna be doing it because again, I've been conditioned to be that way. Right. But to me, it's just, we don't, we don't find that extreme like when you find a friend right <laughs> that does not happen right. like when you when you have a really <laughs> you're not like thank you <laughs> right oh, like it just it doesn't it does not have that same same effect and yeah. and, and right. what i what i love about the book and what i really just love about you you working very hard to just destigmatize singleness is that like it is okay. Like, and, and because that, when you get engaged, when you get married, there's such a high positive um, mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. The opposite of that naturally is this really low, sad emotion. So the women who are over here are like, yeah, we got it. We good. We blah, blah, blah. And the other, the rest of us are like, <laughs> how do I get to the other side of the street? I love it that you're trying to bridge that gap. That yeah. it's so you can be very happy and very fulfilled on both sides of it. Clearly we have a relationship podcast. This is a relationship network. And mm -hmm. so we absolutely promote healthy, happy relationships, right? You do have to add the adjectives to describe the type of relationships you want. For sure. But I, I thought about like you, because to me, this is not just about the relationships that are not romantic. It's also about like having a really healthy, positive relationship with yourself. Absolutely. So how do you work on that? How, is that, are you an, into affirmations? I know you love like golfing and swimming, but like <laughs> what other things do you do to like really take care of yourself and love on you? 
That's a really great question. So I do have my mental health Mondays okay. where I see my therapist every Monday at 10 o'clock. And okay. I think that's super duper important that in yeah. every space that I'm in, I want to say that because I want us to destigmatize mental health. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I see my therapist every Monday. But that I my mantra on Monday is that I do all of the things that I want to do. And none of the things that I have to do. I love that. I yeah. So if I want to send an email, it's because I wanted to. If I want to go to the golf course, it's because I wanted to. Um, not because I need to. Because here's what's so funny. Every Tuesday, that same stuff that I was supposed to needed to do on Monday is still there it on still Tuesday. Still <laughs> it is not gone. It's it like, is it not it gone. No way. Like, right, right, right. so, like, so I really try to. I, so I do all the fun stuff. I usually am golfing. I'm usually swimming. Do all that type of great stuff. But also, and I, can, are we allowed to use profanity on here yeah, for illustration yeah, sure. purposes? Okay. So one of the things that my dear girlfriend, Jackie Pierce, told me, she's about 55, I'm calling Jackie all the way out. She said, <laughs> first and last. Right, right, <laughs> call her, call her, call her, 55. Oh, okay, hey, Jackie, right, girl. Right, girl. Name. Right, right, right. Um, so I'm going to use profanity for illustration purposes. Jackie said, when you turn 50, you give zero. F- mm. I turned 50 August 3rd, and I give zero. F- I turn 50 and I don't care what people think about me. Mm -hmm. I don't care what people say about me. First of all, I'm a black woman. You gonna have all kinds of stereotypes and tropes that are already, that have nothing. I can't even even waste my time. So so if that's the case, (laughs) let me at least be myself. So I'm a tenured professor too. So they can't fire me at the university of Maryland and my dossier is in for a full professor. So I'll be the first black woman who's gone from assistant to associate to full in the sociology department at the university of Maryland. Oh, oh sure. that part. So, like, listen, just, <laughs> right, listen, I like the way your busy will fuck sounds. It sounds very impressive. Listen, listen. So, I like just having the freedom to just know I'm like, okay, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. I'm an acquired taste to some people, mm-hmm. and I am 100% okay with that. Because what I've, what I've noticed in my 50 years of, of, of being on this earth is that people are either like, oh, that's my girl. I'm absolutely down with her, yeah. or she's too much. Mm-hmm. There's no in between. You're never lukewarm with me, and I'm good with that. But I'm like, I know who I am. I stand confidently who I am. I know if you with me, you with me. If you're not, you're not. But I just don't. I try my very best not to. I don't get caught up in what people think about me. For sure. I mean, anybody yeah. who sits on the fence, if <laughs> it, it never works. Like, yeah. somebody yeah. still doesn't like you. Some people still do like you. Even matter. when they try to play the middle, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. And I, I make it a practice to do what I want to do. I yeah. really do. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, Mm-mm, I don't want to go. So speaking of doing what you want to do, you kind of mentioned that there was a relationship oh. that you were engaged and it so, went left and listen on this show we talk about real talk love about scenarios real. Okay. people write okay. in they tell us about their scenarios so tell us a little bit about this I scenario think i might change the name to protect the innocent i call jackie <laughs> pierce all the way out but i won't call him all the way out right 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 but, uh, <laughs> let me just say, say like this innocent, let me just say it. let me just say it like this we gonna call him bob for the sake of this okay. conversation hey, Bobby. hey bob so bob <laughs> so i met bob when i was in graduate school okay. in california okay. and so bob and i said we're gonna get married so he proposed all this kind of non stuff i was like yeah he's like are you gonna tell your friends and family because it was kind of like a little private proposal. I was like, no, just see the ring. I just mm. wasn't really feeling it. But I, was like, <laughs> I was like, okay. So Bob and I are both Christians. So Bob okay. and I decided we weren't going to have sex until we got married. Okay, mm. I did that. Bob did thought, the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Bob thought it was, Bob, Bob thought we just weren't supposed to have sex together. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, you know, like not, you two not. weren't supposed to have sex, but Bob could do what he wanted to do. That's what Bob told me. Oh Jesus! So, <laughs> yes, you were with somebody yeah. recently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So y'all weren't waiting for marriage. You were waiting for marriage, right? It was scary. Right. Yes. Yes. right. So yeah, Bob has since gotten married and has gotten divorced, and I think he might be married again. I don't know, but like, yeah, Bob Dang, was Bob. tall dark and handsome mm. and just as fu- just chocolate i mean he was just just dripping with chocolate but at the end of the day i'm like Mm-mm. everything's like glitter and gold i'm like absolutely not wow Bye. no i mean because that's such a commitment because dre, dre did that for before he got married mm-hmm. like waited for marriage but that is in fact a commitment and if, if you're reneging on that <laughs> Why would I proceed into the that's actual? Just, wow, that's a, to right. do. Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah, look, right, right. And then one guy just recently he told me, um, he said, um, he, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. He said something like, "Oh, you're like a, you're just, you're just too much. Like, you know, you come into the room, people gravitate towards you, and you're like, you're a, a extraordinary. I didn't see somebody who's gonna just blend into the walls, and you know, you're, you take too much work. And I was like, um." Like 45 minutes, he went on about all that I was. Oh. And so I was like, you do realize this whole conversation is about you and it has nothing 
to do with me. Mm. I'm a Ruth Chris kind of chick, but you want a McDonald's kind of chick. And I appreciate you for saying that mm. out loud. Mm. I'll make sure that if anybody, <laughs> if anybody asks what happened to us, I'm going to be sure to just tell them this exact conversation that we just had. I said, but let me give you this little piece of advice, though. President Obama would not be President Obama without Michelle Obama. Not at all. Mm. I was like, so you just want the easy route out. You want to get yourself a, a McDonald's kind of chick? Well, me and all of my grandeur are up out of here. He wanted a Melania. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that part. I'll move on. I will move part. on. I will move on. That part. That part. See, I'm like, it's got to make sense. I, it's got to make sense. If it don't make sense, I was like, yeah, I ain't doing that. I'm like, I'm not doing this. But so yeah. what's your message to women like that? Because I think that is the thing that a lot of women struggle with. I, I'm accomplished. I have a bright light. I tilt the room when I walk in, but that's intimidating to men. Like, what's your message to women like that? I don't think it's intimidating to a man, a real man. To males, to males, it might be. To males, it might be, but to men, it's not. Yeah. I, I, Period, don't, I stop. agree. I, I, I was going to say, <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, 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 like, and the closing credits go up, but like, right. Like, <laughs> but that, I think that leads to what you're talking about in the book, because it does feel like to a lot of women, I don't, don't let me speak for That's you. That's okay. You, you, that, you've uh, been around us. That, that those men are few and far in between like to find and mm -hmm. either they're married already or they're desired by many. So there's a lot of competition with that. So I think that's, why your book is so important in enjoying your singleness. But I do have a question. I don't know if you can answer this. But, but I do just, want to, before you get to that question, I do think just because there's competition doesn't mean that you change your standards. Very true. Okay. I mm -hmm. love that. Maybe we got to pause for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love this woman. <laughs> okay, I'll be good. I ain't going to be invited back. Okay, but hold no, on. I love it. I love it. But I do, I don't know if you can answer this question, but is singleness inevitable for some women and i mean from just a pure number standpoint in this relationship musical chairs are there enough men for women okay so if you're just asking a question a question about the sex ratio and balance yes there are more women than there are men period full stop okay, okay. if you start talking about educational homogamy and this is when you want to marry somebody on the same level as you, it's so the same class level, same education, same um, socioeconomic status level. Men, the women, black women outnumber black men there as well. So if I, Chris Marsh, want to marry another black male PhD who owns his own home, has a living trust and will and makes $250,000, he may or may not be there. For the most part, he's not there. But what I really try to get people to understand in the book is that whether or not you're dating by choice or by force or by circumstance, mm -hmm. we have to have a larger conversation, especially because we're talking about black America. We have to talk about how our dating dating pool is already constrained. And so one of the things one of the things I argue in the book, and I say it multiple times, is that we have to understand how structural forces constrain our personal choices. If I were to say that differently, we have to we have to understand how racism constrains our personal choices. Like I said, if I want to marry a black male PhD, he's simply not there, the numbers aren't there, especially when you're talking about professional black women. Yeah. So it's important to have a conversation about how structure plays into this. Because if we don't have a structural conversation, there's gonna be a lot of black women that are professional and got their stuff together, like, what was me, what's wrong with me? Baby girl, listen, nothing's absolutely wrong with you. There's structural forces that were designed well before you got here. Mm. So don't put the onus solely on yourself. There is a structural conversation. I am a sociologist, and we oftentimes leave it at the individual level, and that's very short-sighted. There's a whole structure. We have to understand that it's constrained our dating pool. So to the point that you were making earlier because our dating pool is constrained there's more competition but what are we willing to do when there's more competition i was like no that's not the answer that we have to go back and think <laughs> about how the dating pool is constrained yeah. so i was on bet a little while ago the book had just came out it came out like february they called me like march i thought i was like the most popular thing <laughs> I was like, this thing get ready to blow all the way up i'm getting ready to go viral the only viral video i had on social media was about swimming that's a whole other story from <laughs> i wish i would have had the book like in the background or that's something okay. right so we, they interviewed me for two and a half hours, two and a half hours, two and a half hours. So they put something up on social media. It was like 30 seconds. And it's like yeah. this, this is a snippet. And they're like, Dr. Marsh said, pay reparations if you want to improve marriage rates. And I was like, no, like, they, that's the only thing. That's the took only thing for two and a half hours. I was like, I was like, you know, them comments, the comments be commenting. So I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm not going to the comments. But one of my friends was like, yeah, I'm just going to start responding for you. Just don't even go. Because it was it was that's a good friend right there. Yeah, that's you know, a friend. I was like, I'm not 
I was like, I don't want to do that. So I'm yeah, not. That's a good friend. That's a really good friend because that is a stressful experience. It's a stressful. But you know, with a, with a friend that knows the book, they're like, oh, what she meant was, you know, they're going mm. in. I'm like, hmm. but here's the point. If we think about structural forces and how it's constrained personal choices, I do believe that you need to pay black Americans reparations, period, full stop. If you give black people access to capital, Mm -hmm. Will you then see more black men that are in this dating pool and what these black women can draw from? My theory may be wrong, but at the end, if my theory shot, so what? Black Americans still got reparations. So either way, it's still a win-win. Sure. Yeah. I, would say I don't care. Right. Prove my theory wrong, but give me my reparations. But it is a structural conversation. It is not an individual conversation. But people will sit home at night and think like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. I'm not thick enough. I'm too fat. I'm not thin enough. I'm not light enough. I'm not tall enough. This is by design. Mm. As like racism permeates our personal choices. Mm. It does. I mean, it, 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 like you said, it goes beyond things that we can even yeah. control. Cause even the whole time you were saying that I'm like, so what do you think about like when they say you should just date, date someone that doesn't like stop worrying about that. Like I saw on a, on a popular podcast, I can't think of it right now, but um, I believe it was Tyler Perry who mm -hmm. was like, he has a friend oh, who, yeah. who, um, it makes a lot of money. He says she's a she's a she's a millionaire, and financially she's very comfortable. Her career, she's very comfortable. Everything that she like tangibly needs, she has it. Lots of her wants, they're met. But the only thing was that she she wanted love and she didn't have it, and and she kept romantic running into love. yes, romantic, romantic love, romantic <laughs> love. And um, he was like, you know, she just decided one day that all of those boxes that needed to be checked for someone to be her equal in that way to have the same income socioeconomic level he was like she she dropped that and that's when she found romantic love and he said so he based on that is encouraging women to be more open to that where like if those boxes are checked for you do you really need a partner that is equally earning equally educated owns his own home as well has his own car as well like can you actually forego those things and literally when you were just sitting there talking i was like nope that's really she's like no you're fine if you what you want is what you want <laughs> whatever that but may enjoy be. but mm -hmm. enjoy being alone if that's truly not what you want to do and right. there were so many women like that clip went very viral yeah. and you saw a clear division of women that were like stop policing us stop policing our standards those who want what we want we're going to go after what we want we're not going to dumb it down no matter what the numbers say but then there were others that were like yeah we, we probably do need to adjust because mm -hmm. why do i need him to bring that to the table mm -hmm. if i already have all of that mm -hmm. and what are your thoughts on it <clears throat> okay so, <laughs> so i got a couple thoughts i got a couple thoughts first i think what's really interesting about i appreciate the conversation i think black women have to make a decision sure i don't care where you sit in the conversation i don't care which way you decide to sit in the conversation stop policing black women let us be yeah. is my first part mm -hmm. number two though we don't have that same conversation with white women mm. pause pregnant pause okay so <laughs> Instead of spending so much time talking about what black women should and should not do, why don't we try to advocate for reparations? Mm -hmm. Put your energies other places. White women don't have those structural forces that we have to contend with. We have those structural forces. So if you want a whole bunch of men that have got PhDs and buying houses, that's like give us an access to capital. Yeah. It's a structural conversation. I will not allow it to be left at the individual level. Because if we do, there are people be at home crying themselves asleep thinking they did something wrong. So I have to keep pushing back and say, let's have the structural conversation. Yeah. But black, white women are not sitting here having this conversation. Why is that? Do you think it's because they view marriage differently than black women, I guess, structurally or how they were brought up, that the view of the purpose of it and what to get out of it is viewed differently than black women? I don't know that they view it differently. And, that, you know, black women are not a monolithic. We're not yeah, a monolithic yeah, group, true. so we don't know about all black women. But I, it's not so much about how they view it. It's about the access. They have they have access. There's there's white men that have the same kind of. I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So it's I not. It. It, so it's not an issue. It, it, right. it, it comes with they can marry, ease for the most part. Right. Because yeah. they go, they're going to they're going to find men that have like the advanced degrees like they mm -hmm. do or make the two hundred fifty thousand dollars, whatever may possibly be. So, yeah, yeah, it's 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 the numbers. It's a numbers game for them. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, we could argue like whether or not like black, white women see like as con contracts or something like that. Yeah, that could be that could be part of the conversation. But I think black women, there's some black women that might see it the same way, too. Yeah. 
I, I think I, go ahead. No, I was just saying, even with that conversation too, as I think about it too, I think if you're in that like top 1%, 5% of earners, just in general, just whether you're a man too, and you want somebody at that same level, it's going to be challenging as well. Mm-hmm. Not as challenging as it would be probably for a black woman, but sure. just you have to understand, I think if you're at that level of being an earner or something like that, it's just going to be hard to find or more challenging to find your equal. Mm-hmm. No matter what your gender is. Yeah. And then you start adding just additional layers like where you live, <laughs> what your physical preferences <laughs> right, yeah, are, what like, you look like, right. like all of these things that are just factors that just go into dating. Like right. you can't control what people see and what they like. Like your friend who's like, I like light skinned women. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, you know, like they, they, they're so. Sit. No, you don't. <laughs> like, right. Like, no, you That's don't. That's not it. But, but the data is pretty clear, right? So what we do know is like regardless of race. People typically um, um, gravitate to people that are like them. Yeah, mm-hmm. very true. And so, but then when it gets to black Americans, like, okay, well, now you can't do that. You don't have the same, ab- black women in particular, you don't have the same ability. That's kind of like naturally what we do, gravitate to people that, that are like us, whether or not that's race, clash, gen- no, not gender, but um, hobbies, r- interests. Yeah. We gravitate yeah. to people that are like us. Mm-hmm. And so you're telling, now you're telling them that they can't do that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can't. Okay. You can't like that. Like you can't do that. You, you get a, but the data is clear. That. That's what we know. Yeah. It's called homogamy. It's 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 pretty consistent. That's what we do. I really want you to like. I don't want to say give tips, but like a real lasting message to people to like how to have this joy that you have truly because it is I mean you can see it I'm sure you all are watching at home like it is <laughs> by the way I thought this was just audio I did not know it was <laughs> <laughs> I said that even, if, you, even like, if you're not watching it you can told me. hear it you can you can hear it that there is like true joy there are people who probably think like oh this is an act you're just bitter you're just doing this because you're just trying to keep black women single like this is not real but I feel it like I we, you know, I follow you on social media. I see it like you are truly happily living your life. One part of that is that you're single. One mm-hmm. part of that is that you're single. You're so much more expansive than that. Like, how can people really tap into that joy? Not just women, but but single men as well who may feel like that feeling that I sometimes feel like that loneliness or like, I don't really want to have to be this way. How can we get out of that rut? Right. Um. I wish I had like some like really great final thoughts. Um, I can put something together. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because people like meet me. They're like, you know, you are who you are on the social media. Yeah. And I am like unapologetically black and I am really trying to support black folks. I'm trying to get black folks to really stand confidently in who they are, yeah. whether or not you're single, you're married, whether or not you're in America, you're another part of the world. Um, but so one of the things I do say in the book, which I think is really important, and I want to talk about this briefly, and then I'll talk about like, you know, something to think about. Um, I also talk about how um, singles are discriminated against in mm. plain sight. Yeah. And we need to talk about that. And I give three examples about how, because I am arguing in the book that when we talk about the term family, so I'm a, like, again, I'm a sociologist and a demographer, mm. and I use census data to like do these national trends. Part of the reason why I also wanted to make sure I started doing national trends is because I did something for CNN years ago. And um, they were like, I did a like a vlog, a video or something. And um, afterwards, I got, a, it just blew up. It just blew all the way up. And so they said, um, would you please read the comments? And I was like, I don't read comments. I do not read comments. And they're like, no, 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 no. They're not that bad. Like, how about we pull some of the comments out and you just respond to them? Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay. So they gave me like 10 or 12. I was like, these are the good <laughs> ones? God, I do not want to see the bad ones. <laughs> so one person, and I'm assuming it was a male, I'm just a stereotyping, but this one guy, I think his name was like a male name. He said something like, oh, Dr. Marsh probably just talked to a whole bunch of her girlfriends in the hair salon and wrote this article about this demographic shift Mm. in the black middle class i was like Mm. no i actually used national data to show you that this demographic shift exists and so it's really important that i do that because i don't want people think i just sat around and talked to a whole bunch of my girlfriends i have national data um so one of the things that i talk about is i talk about singlehood and i use census data the census defines family as someone that you're related to by blood marriage or adoption okay if we know that singlehood is on the rise, please don't quote me on the on the percentage, but I think about 44% of uh, all adults in America over the age of 25 are single. 44% are single. Don't quote me on the actual percentage. We could put that like in the reel at the bottom or something, <laughs> in the marquee. Um, 
So if we're if if people that are not married don't have any children and have never been married cannot be defined as a family, we're discriminated against them in plain sight. Three examples to get you to think about. Verizon cell phone. I want the family plan on my one cell phone. I want to pay less for my one cell phone. <laughs> Sounds like a benign example. A more egregious example would be like um, going on vacation. Double occupancy versus single occupancy. A single mm-hmm. occupant pays way more than someone who's a double occupant. Discriminating in plain sight. Especially if you buy my argument that structural forces have constrained my personal choices. And for whatever reason, I cannot partner and then the one that everybody on this call or everybody watching this video will shake their heads to is the tax structure (laughs) yep there's a single hood penalty shaking shaking our head shaking our head there's a single hood penalty built into the tax structure it's a great book that comes out of the law tradition by a lady named dorothy brown and it's called the whiteness of wealth and one of the arguments dorothy brown makes is that people we should all file our taxes as singles And I'm like, if we can't all file our taxes as single, I want to file my taxes as the Marsh family. And I want to get the Marsh (laughs) family discount on my taxes. I I am. I clearly I am in favor of such. I am absolutely in favor of such. Because like you said, like it's for whatever the reasons are. I can't. Right. I, I, I cannot have a family in the way that it's already described. Right. But why am I being penalized like financially for that like that's not i can't necessarily control that right so in open sight in plain sight yeah is there like any like because i'm trying to figure out why it would be right is there any data that suggests that families economically contribute more than singles oh when singles get more this is the book (laughs) <laughs> so, that ain't, so that one ain't, so that one ain't working <laughs> i'm just wondering because you know because all these c- constructs were created mm-hmm. to somebody's advantage right right yeah. for some reason and you know some of them are very obvious but some of them you sit there and wonder like huh why what who was this exactly for? right mm-hmm. right and i wonder why that system is set up the way it is because it had to benefit somebody in particular the person who or the people or group who came up with these laws Mm -hmm. and structures of doing Mm -hmm. things so i don't at the end of the day i don't really want to change a term if you want to change the term family fine but most importantly i want people who don't have a quote-unquote family or single people to get the same advantages as families. Mm. So if that means we got to change the term, we have to change the term. But at the end of the day, make sure we all get the same kind of advantages. Yeah. And then again, if I were to like leave you with something to think about, I two things. One, I would say, you know, after reading the book and after having listened to this conversation, please do pick up the book. Um, we need to ask single, we need to ask married folks and single folks, why are you single and why are you married? We're constantly asking married fo- single folks, but we don't ask married folks. Okay. And that continues to push this kind of deficit model. And then I would ask us or admonish us to think about how we look at single folks and how we view married folks. Mm. I think to be single, even though it is stigmatizing, is sometimes can be much harder than actually being married. But sometimes we think like, oh, you've arrived. You're the pinnacle of success because you are married. We need to look at those relationships and make sure that they're not abusive, toxic, unfulfilling, and unrewarding. But I think it's important for us to understand how we think about singles and what set of assumptions we make around single folks Mm -hmm. and what set of assumptions we make around married folks that requires us to do some soul searching some introspection and some reflection but why do we make a certain set of assumptions or have certain ideas about single folks and a different set of ideas about married folks and one last thing i'm gonna talk about because that's really important one of these one of the things that happened in the book, I think this is in a footnote. Again, so all the really, really good stuff in the footnote. I want to say one thing that's sociological and then back to the point about um, sex. Well, I'm getting to sex. Okay, but uh, so like footnotes, you have to read the footnotes because like there's two things. There's two footnotes that like really stand out to me. One is that we were asking the Love Jones cohort. Cohort's nothing more than a band of people. It's a demographic term. Mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure people who didn't have access to education learn new terms. So my mother's like... My mother will be in the grocery store. Oh, Christy's cohort of people. I was like, mother, that's not how you do it. My mother running around using a cohort. That girl, you should go use some cohort. I'm like, thank you, mother. I got a new um, word. <laughs> great. Um, so we were talking, and one, we were asking, like, how did the Love Jones cohort think about, like, their responsibility to the larger black community, right? And mm-hmm. so they talked about uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' notion of the talented 10th. Real basic terms, W.E.B. Du Bois, being a sociologist, said that um, 10% of the black population will uprise the entire 
90, 90 other percent. Mm -hmm. He pushed back against his own idea later on. But I, as a sociologist, as a black female sociologist, could not leave the conversation there. So I put a footnote and said, at the same time that W.E.B. Du Bois was writing, there was another scholar who was writing. The argument this scholar was making was that if you improve the life chances of black women, you'll improve the life chances of everybody. That mm -hmm. scholar's name was Anna Julia Cooper. A lot of people don't know her because there were gatekeepers that wouldn't allow her work to get published. Mm. A black woman. Yeah. Brilliant. Some of the gatekeepers happened to be W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm. One of my graduate students in Canada wrote a really good article about W.E.B. Du Bois and Anna Julia Cooper. And the academic rumor skedaddle, her name was Kim Martez Phillips. Um, one of the academic, some of the academic skedaddle is that um, he actually plagiarized some of her stuff mm. later wow. on. So I, as a female scholar, black female scholar, could not have W.E.B. Du Bois in my book without putting a footnote like, bam! <laughs> there goes some Anna Julia Cooper right there for you. One other footnote, then on to sex. Mm -hmm. So there's another footnote where we're talking about the, the gender wage gap. Mm. And we know that women make less than men, right? Sure. Yep. So there's, called, there's a thing called equal pay day. And this is going to get to my shoes that I have on because I actually have on some Alice and Felix shoes. I want to make sure you get, get my Alice and Felix shoes in the shop. In the shop <laughs> they are very please. cute. Like, like, very I'm, I'm going to tell you about them in a second. <laughs> okay. So it's called Equal Pay Day. So what it is is like it's how far women would have to work into the new year to make what the average white male, white man made the following year. So don't quote me on the numbers, but I think like if we think about it just from like a male female perspective, women would have to work until March of the new year to make what the average white man made the following year. This is based on 2020 data and it's in the book. But for black women, oh, black women had to work Lord. all the way until September mm. of wow. the new year to make what the average white man made. I calculated, I think it calculated it up. I think it was 264 days. We had to work into the new year to make what the average white man made. That's a footnote. That does not necessarily relate to the singlehood or anything <laughs> that like that. Just, but that's a, that's a, that's that's a sheer sociology. That is like, like, and so to the point, Allison Felix, when she told Nike she was pregnant, they decreased her contract by 70%. Mm. She dropped Nike and started her own shoe line. I have them in every single color, flavor, <laughs> flavor. She <laughs> also had a shirt that came out a couple of weeks ago that said, pay me like a white man. And let me tell you, wearing that thing in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they was all looking at Fire. you. She said they all like, that's, <laughs> it's a sweatshirt. It's a sweatshirt. It's a sweatshirt. It's a sweatshirt. I have another one that a black woman made, and it says, um, They've stolen more than we could ever lose. Mm. Damn. Mm, that's deep right that there. That one is good. <laughs> I need to leave. I was like, I, I gotta see what part of the country I'm going to now. Right now. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, right. And it's really, a lot of white men, when I have on my pay me like a white man, they're like, I like your shirt. I'd be mm -hmm. like, bet. I'd be like, bet. <laughs> okay, the last comment I was gonna make about like how we stereotype, how we make a certain set of assumptions about single folks. One of the things I had to grapple with is that sex just did not come up. Yeah. And so, I, took, I called my colleague, Bella DePaul, one of the people that I call and other people that I write. And I was like, sex did not come up at all. I was like, I don't know what I should do about this. I think I put it in a footnote. I don't remember. I actually don't remember where I put it. But sex really didn't come up. And so um, I was like, okay, I, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. So I remember I did a book talk at a private house, a private book talk at a house. And so one of the ladies said, well, Dr. Marsh, you know, I appreciate the book. It's really inspiring, blah, blah, blah. But what about sex? Sex just didn't come up. And I was like, I think if we're not careful, we will equate being promiscuous with being single. And I interviewed mm. 74 people. Sex did not come up. And let me tell you, so people are so baffled. They're like, are you sure you asked the right questions? I was like, why do you think <laughs> sex had to be a part of the conversation? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, because we're very obsessed with it as a, as a culture. That as part. a people. We just That are. part. Yeah. Now, I ain't saying black folks. We ain't talking about black folks. I ain't saying black folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 that's a world. Yeah. 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 Or but when just, you're discussing singleness, people you, you, think yeah. it's so like. So you don't get to have sex? Like, what are you right. doing? Are you out there getting a whole bunch of it and don't want to settle down? It's like, sex did did not come up yeah. gets back to the point about what you what assumptions you make about single folks and what assumptions you make about married folks so what what assumptions because do you have some of the you, most promiscuous people and not with their partners married. and not with their partners uh oh yeah. uh oh uh oh time to go now okay it's 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 time to go now okay
Yeah, I just well, I, first I love everything <laughs> we talked about today. There's so good. Two things I, that really stood out to me is that even what you talk about in the book about singleness and building those relationships outside of just the romantic relationships. I find that so important being married, like in your marriage too, like not putting all your emotional or relationship eggs in that basket. Mm -hmm. Cause I hear a lot of people talk about Ron and I talk about this. They're married, the old ball and chain. Like it's like you're letting go of something, but I'll tell people I feel free in my marriage. And that's because we have other mm -hmm. relationships outside of each other. If I say I'm going to hang with my boys, my wife isn't like, no, I don't have to ask permission. It's like, Hey, I'm hanging with my friends right. and she has her friends. But I see a lot of times I call it red flags or not to where people enter a relationship and that person doesn't have friends. Right. And I've seen those relationships go to hell because it's like yep. they're on that person 24 seven. Then mm -hmm. they get insecure. If they're hanging out with their friends. Why, why can't I come? Why can't you hang out with me? What you doing? Why y'all so long? And then that disrupts everything. So yeah. although in singleness, it can help you. I think in relationships too, that's you know a huge part yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also love how we had this whole conversation. And although you talked about black women and their singleness, you did not bash black men at all. Oh. And I appreciate <laughs> oh. that because, you know, so a lot of times the conversations that does happen mm -hmm. and it does. we all have our work to do. Right. Um, but we have our different things that we're battling economically, socially, um, that we're trying to figure out and mm -hmm. navigate and, you know, fight against. And yeah. I think as long as we're coming together and having these constructive conversations, then we can better understand each other. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So it's really funny because when I wrote the book, I was talking to my mentor and I was like, um, since women dominate the category, I think I interviewed 62 people, I think 40 or 40. 50 of those were women. So 19 were men. So do that. You, you do the math. Mm -hmm. um, I could have written a book just about just about black women, of course. but I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I didn't want to is because I think that it's not just a black woman issue. Yeah. Right. There are at least 19 black men out there who have never been married, don't have any children. I interviewed them, right? <laughs> at least. I'm like, at least 19, <laughs> right? Um, there's one that was married. Uh, he had a child. So I'm like, we got to take you out the data set. Like, why did you wait 75 minutes into this interview to tell us this? Though? Yeah. But anyways, but one of the things that was really, and I'm glad that I did, because that's when we started to normalize those non-romantic nurturing relationships. That mm -hmm. was a gender difference that I saw show up. Another gender difference that I thought is so fascinating, as I and I as a sociologist struggle with what this actually means. So the women were hopeful that they would get married one day. And for the men, it was just a matter of time before they did. Mm. And when I think about that as a sociologist, I'm like, so are black men that I interviewed just choosing the lesser of two evils? So if we're talking about, you know, how we need to pick and who we need to pick, we really should be talking to black men sometimes and not necessarily talking to black women. But black women, they are all, all on us, like what we should and should not be doing. I agree. So I appreciate that I had the black men in the book because there were some gender nuances that I picked up and I'm so happy that I included them. For but sure. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. But I think, but to your, to your first point, yeah, marriage is not a panacea. Get yourself some friends. You need to have yourself some friends sure. and just because you get into a relationship does not mean that you forsake your friends because you might unless you and your partner die at the exact same time <laughs> which it rarely happens. Ra rarely ever happens yeah right so you need to have your friends and we and people that are insecure about you having friends it, mm, that's a, that's a that's something to big old red flag that's, that's something to think about you know uh -huh. just need some thinking on that one well remind us again and all of our listeners and watchers where can they get the book <clears throat> So it is it's an audio book too. The audio book is out. I did not narrate the audio book. So people are mad that I didn't. I was about to say, you could have. I sure. know. They would have taken me too long to narrate. And you just slow my, I didn't know you could slow your voice down by, what? You could have done you the can. narration. Um, so I prefer that you get it from any independent black owned bookstore. You can just go and ask for it. I know they have it at Sankofa in DC. I'm actually doing a book talk there soon. You can get it on Amazon and you can also get it from Cambridge University Press. Listen, here's one part I do want you to understand because I did not know this about academic presses. Cambridge is one of the top academic presses in the world. I don't say that to brag. I say that because I think that I am blessed and highly favored and I mm -hmm. thank God for all the blessings that have been bestowed upon me. With that being said, Cambridge gets 90% of each sale of my book. My book is $30. I get $3. I was thought I was going to sell so many books, I was going to buy me a Rolex. I'm getting ready to try to buy me a Swatch watch or an iPhone. 
an iPhone watch. But listen, please don't listen, listen. Please don't share your copies. I need no, everybody to get their own copy. Get your ID by three dollars. I'm trying to buy a Swatch watch. I'm trying to buy a Rolex, not on Amazon. Doctor. So, <laughs> Chris, if the barista doesn't thing doesn't work out, you got a you got a job Stand in up. comedy. Stand you up. have a job in comedy. I was like, for real, I was like, I'm gonna buy a Rolex. I was like, but listen, so yeah, I'm just but here, but, but here's my though. But Mavado, that's decent. Yeah. Decent. I thought a, I thought a Rolex was adulting, right? I was like, you know, there are some, you know. Yeah. Some, okay, but here, but here's kind of like the thing, though. I didn't. All of my friends are academic. A lot of my friends are academics. Nobody told me I was going to get ten percent, ten percent on each book sale. Now. What is a, what I appreciate is that it allowed being that it's published with Cambridge. I'm actually going to the UK to have a book talk at Cambridge University. Yeah. I'm going to University of Toronto tomorrow. I've been in I've been in the universities across the country. I've been in South Africa talking about the book. So I do think that Cambridge opened up some doors. Yes, and I got a chance cool. to be but, yeah, I got a chance to be on the, the podcast with you all. So yeah, 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 yeah. This, yeah. But the please, second right. book, give her at least fifty percent. You know, right? Like, all right. Like, and also, just, when you, you know, buy so. your book, buy one for your friend. <laughs> yes, buy. Yeah. For your friend, don't please don't don't, don't don't make copies and share. Don't get the PDF. I needs my three dollars, please and thank you. No bootleg, no bootleg videos and no bootleg um, <laughs> books, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Chris Marsh, thank you, thank, thank you so you. much, thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> this thank is you. so good.